Hi, hello, welcome. My name is Amanda, and I am at Battleground Games and Hobbies in Abington, Massachusetts. Battleground is a game, hobby, miniature, card game, board game store uh, with three locations in the greater Boston area. We have one here in Abington, one up north in Saugus, and one down a little further south in Norton. I'm in Abington today because Abington has our streaming rig and the loft where I can do some painting. So I'm going to be painting some figures today. I'm going to be doing figures from the Highlander board game. Highlander board game. Um, this was a game that was kickstarted on, um, <coughs> kickstarted by River Horse Games, who put out the um, uh, Dark Crystal and Labyrinth games. And those have very similar play to them. The Highlander game is very different in terms of how it plays. It uses the same sort of dice. There's a similarity there, but the actual gameplay is very, very, very different. And it has a whole bunch of figures from the first and only movie. So here we have um, Iman Fasil. He's the guy that Connor McLeod beheads in the parking garage right at the beginning of the movie. He's very boring looking. Um, so my figure, my copy of this game is fully painted. Um, I did that uh, a few months back. And the videos from that are on YouTube. You can definitely find them. Our YouTube link is down below that away, I think. Um, but they were sort of intercut. I was doing a lot of reference um, research. I was looking up photos and stills and stuff because, as you might guess, this is from like the opening scene of the movie. There's not a lot. And it's like a, he's wearing a suit and an overcoat. Like, oh, he's super boring. Um, but yeah, I was doing a lot of reference work, so we're going to be actually painting my friend Sarah's copy of this game, which I got for her as a gift. And I am painting for her as a gift. So her figures are all primed. I did that last week. Um, so we're going to be painting, and this is going to need a lot less reference um, research for me because I have my figures painted. I already did the reference research. So I'm quickly going to go through um, the figures as they are already done, so you have a, an idea of what I'm going to be working on. So here we have Iman Fasil. Yes, he is white. There is an explanation for that in the game. The actual rule book for the game um, has backstory for a bunch of characters, which is really cool. Because if you think back to the one and only movie, it's so weird, they never met anymore. Um, there aren't that many immortal characters. There are a bunch of characters, but when it comes to immortals, you have Connor, you have um, the Kurgan, obviously, you have Ramirez, you have um, Imam Fasil, obviously, and you have my friend here. Um, his name? Why am I blanking on his name? Castigar. Um, so you have a whole bunch of characters, but that's like five dudes, most of whom are white, with the exception of Castigar. I know it's, I know like the backstory for Ramirez is that he's Egyptian, but he's played by Sean Connery, so whatever. Um, the board game actually could not get the rights to Sean Connery's face, apparently that's rather expensive, so instead they got like some Instagram model dude. He's fine. The figures are, I mean, the figure is, is awesome. The figure is gorgeous. There is a, an expansion, which I'm not doing today, but I will be doing it in the future. And the expansion has 
other time period versions of all of the characters from the base game. So, as I was saying, five guys, all but one of them is played by a white actor. All dudes. So, the board game um, <coughs> has two original characters. I really like them. We have Talia. She is Mesoamerican. I believe she's Mayan. Let me double check that. Aztec. She's Aztec. Um, she was born in 1504. She was supposed to be a sacrifice to save her people. Like she was a voluntary sacrifice to save her people from the um, conquistadors. Then she came back to life. Oops. N her people not super thrilled with that because that to them means their gods rejected their sacrifice. So that's not cool. Um, so she and her father had to take off and run. So this is her modern day. Um, modern day, she has become fairly nihilistic. Um, she's also got, there's a great bit of visual storytelling on her figure. The older version that's in the expansion is her like original lifetime. And her necklace, she has the same necklace, but it's a lot more elaborate. There's a lot more pieces to it. So the visual storytelling there is that she's been breaking pieces off of it as time goes on to pay for whatever. So I like her. She was awesome. I got to do camo pants on her. She was really fun. I gave her armpit hair because goodness knows when you're, you know, running guns, you are not shaving. Maybe you are. She's not. So we have her. We have Iman Fasil. This is the other original character. This is Naminaga Minamoto, which was a noble woman in Japan. And she was found by a wandering immortal after becoming immortal herself, and they ended up roaming the countryside fighting evildoers. They were sort of like um, Robin Hood sort of figures, you know going around helping out those in need. So I think that's really cool. She had the nickname the Grey Ghost. And um, I actually, when I was doing reference research on her, I went and looked up kimonos to find one that I really liked. I found this really cool one with all this floral work. So this is referenced off a real kimono. The gold uh, obi. That was actually a really, this was difficult to do. Um, the floral work, there's actually a time-lapse uh, sort of sped up video of me doing the floral work on her. So we have two original characters. We have Iman Fasil, who we've seen. We have Ramirez, who's got his peacock feather cloak, which is just so very extra. So that was fun to paint. A lot of iridescent sort of stuff going on there. Ooh, no, I don't have that paint. I need to buy some. There's a, an iridescent paint sold by Stuart Semple on Culture Hustle um, that is like legit iridescent, but I guess it's, it's weird. It's like a living crystal. So it's weird. You have to keep it in the fridge, I guess, when you're not using it. So that's strange. You have to shake it to activate it. Um, I do have one of his other paints. We'll uh, we'll talk about Stuart Semple later, I'm sure, because he's one of my favorite topics to talk about is art feuds. But um, we're not going to be using this paint in this, but this is Black 3.0. It is the mattest black paint you can easily buy commercially. Um, because Semple wanted to have that available after his um, art nemesis, Anish Kapoor, bought the exclusive artistic rights to use of Vanta Black. So, yeah, we'll talk about that later. Um, we have Connor McLeod of the Clan McLeod. And, like, reference for him, I had to find stills of the movie to find out what this cloak sort of looks like. 
and then look up the McLeod tartan. A lot going on. Tartans tend to have a lot going on. That's just how it goes. Um, you know, I had to look up the Claymore, I had to look up his sort of rough, it looks like this is actually supposed to be fox fur up here, which is really interesting. And he's got almost like auburn highlights in his hair, which is pretty cool. We have the Kurgan. So this is the Kurgan uh, from like during the, the big sort of, not climactic scene, but the sort of subclimax where he's fighting with Ramirez in the tower in Scotland. So he's got his skull helmet on. It took a lot of looking to find good pictures, like good reference pictures of his, like, his legs. You don't see his legs much. You see a lot from like up here, but all of the, like all of the full body shots, they're all distance shots. There's not a lot of detail there. So that took some doing, but it was a lot of fun to look up. He's a, uh, he's not a nice man, put it mildly. And finally, Castigar. Send to Castigar. He's wearing this sort of, um, it's actually a really light fabric, if you look at it in the movie. This is from the scene where he meets Connor on the bridge, and they share a little booze and chat about the gathering. And he, uh, he's a really cool character. It, there was no way I was going to be able to get exactly the cloth. The cloth that he's wearing, it's this interwoven orange and purple and cream with, like, gold sort of interwoven stuff in these sort of panels down these big stripes down the back. Um, it, the, I, I actually ended up painting this like three times. There's no way to get more orange into it without it looking muddy. As orange and purple together, they just, they just get muddy together. They're both secondary colors, so they've got a lot going on. And yeah, trying to get him to look precise was really difficult. So we're going to go with a purple base again when we do Sarah's copy of him because I think that worked. Oh, maybe I'll try orange this time. But if you look at him in the movie, if you look at the actual fabric, you can tell it's a very even distribution of orange and purple. So difficult. Um, but what I also really like about the game is that it has full backstories for all of the characters. And you would expect that on their original characters because they want to tell you who these people are. But it also has full backstories on the existing characters, which is very cool. And that's how we know um, how Iman Fasil, the whitest of white dudes, ended up with that name. And it's that he took it from someone else. He was a crusader originally, um, and at one point realized that the people that he had been sent to kill were not bad people. They were, you know, people just like the people he knew at home. And he sort of turned away from the Crusaders, which is really interesting. His figure in the expansion is, he's got this mishmash of armor where he's got his Crusader shield with the red cross on it, but he's covered it up with rags. Um, and his helmet is, it's a Saracen helmet. It's not a, a helmet you would have seen on a Crusader. He's wearing sort of almost big baggy bloomers, which are, that's, you would not have seen those pants or anything. I, I did extensive research. Um, so we're not gonna have to do all that research this time, which means once I start painting, I'm not gonna be taking as many breaks to go dig up what this is. This weapon that uh, Talia here is carrying is a maquahuitl. It is a Mesoamerican weapon. It's a hardwood um, bat, almost. It's like a, it, shape and size-wise and sort of heft, it reminds me a lot of a cricket bat. However, unlike a cricket bat, these are heavily decorated. They're carved, usually. And they are studded on the edges with obsidian chips. Obsidian is glass, it's volcanic glass. And obsidian chips, once you've wedged them in there, these are very sharp. So this is like a chainsaw blade 
but sharper and um, heavier. And there are reports of maquiladores being able to sever like horses' heads off their necks. So not a nice weapon. Um, there's actually a card for it in the game, and it is the um, I think it's the brutal maquiladore or something like that. <laughs> You can't just call it the Maquahuil, you have to really hammer home how nasty it is. So yeah, she carries that. She also has it in her other time period version. So she's, uh, I did some research on that. So I'm not going to have to do all this research. I don't have to look up a kimono to reference. I don't have to look for movie stills that show me the Kurgan's knees. Um, I don't have to try and figure out what color tie Iman Fasil is wearing in the parking garage. I know what he's wearing. It's fine. So I'm actually going to be using my figures as reference. So we're going to start with him. I think he's an easy way to go in. He's wearing a black suit. Um, I actually, I did paint it black. I used um, sort of the barest dark gray to do highlighting on him and I gave him a gray trench coat, dark gray trench coat. Uh, white shirt, black vest, red tie. He is wearing leather gloves in the movie, which is cool. And he is just the blondest. But he's also wearing those Ray-Bans, which is really funny. So we're gonna work on him. Not the most exciting figure to start with, but I haven't painted in a little while. Uh, that was the last thing I did. The last thing I did was actually experiment with Black 3.0, and I'm, I am going to show that off because it is really cool. It is legitimately just super matte. Um, the whole point of it is that it does not reflect light, so that if you're painting over a curved surface, you can't really see the curve um, because the, the way we our eyes are perceiving curved surfaces is by seeing the light bouncing off of it, um, whether it's concave or convex, we're seeing light uh, reflect. And that tells us sort of the depth of it and um, the grade of it. This paint is the best you're going to get out of a paint in making something so matte that you just can't tell where the curve is. And I did a little bit of experimenting with it. Do I have it with me? No, I think I must have taken them out of my bag. I did a little bit of experimenting. We have downstairs um, a box of bits that we use for, um, we let people sort of kitbash their minis. And I swiped a couple of little things, like little arm pieces and stuff that didn't seem like they would be anything anyone would really miss. And uh, I played around with it. It makes for amazing shadows if you want something to look menacing. Because once you have the black in the, um, like really in there, in like all the crevices, you are not going to be able to see um, like the depth of it, so it makes it look just nastier. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna bring up, I have chat up on my computer. Normally we have a laptop that we run chat off of, but the laptop is needed downstairs, so we don't have it, so I'm not going to hear chat notifications so if you join me um, normally we say yeah toss us a bit um, or two to get our attention but I'm not going to hear that because if I put on the sound while I'm I have the chat up and I have the stream up I will speech jam myself and that would be annoying so we're going to start with him He's already primed in black, and I did that in very intentionally. Actually, let's do... I don't want to leave his suit just black, though. I do want to paint it instead of just using the primer.
We also don't have anything to run music off of down here, so or up here, so. Um, Yeah, I think that was the last thing I painted was uh, playing around with that. So that wasn't really like... Plug. Um, I think the last thing I actually painted, painted? I played, I did some Fallout figures. Because um, I've been doing slowly the Wasteland Warfare. Um, Fallout figures. Wasteland, Fallout has two games out right now. It's actually getting a third one soon. Um, but it has a board game. Oh, hey, there we go. Um, it has a board game, a miniature war game, and soon a tabletop RPG. That book is due out in a little bit, so that's exciting. And I have Wasteland, the Wasteland Warfare base set in the back room, so, oh, oh hi, yes. So I do have some music going. Or so we just be sitting here in embarrassed silence. I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna tweet that I'm, I'm doing this. I should probably let people know I'm doing it. Too. He is super pale, so there's, so I'm using, um, there we go, I'm using the paints that belong to the store's owner, uh, Derek, because he said I could, he's been very generous about sharing his paints, and he has quite a selection, and uh, these are Reaper, I think. Yeah, these are Reaper Master Series paints that I'm using. Um, I find them a little easier to work with than Citadel paints. He does have, there's a <laughs> very large collection of Citadel paints um, on the chair nearby. 189 paints. It's so many paints. Um, but I find Citadel, um, you have to thin them and then I'm never quite sure of the consistency that I want. I know these colors. These are what I used to paint mine. So we're gonna stick with them. So when I painted him last, I ended up um, basically, I think I ended up just painting his, um, his whole head 
flesh colored because he's so blonde. He's so blonde. But I was like, it's not gonna matter. I don't care if I get some on his hair. He's also not like, okay, so we're just gonna pretend that the actor who played him looked maybe a little younger at the time. He doesn't. One of the things that I, I try to stress when I am painting is that your first coat is going to look like garbage. And there's a reason for that, and that's because you're not doing fine detail work yet. You're just trying to establish a base coat. I suppose there are people who are far better at this than me who could go in and be really precise right from the get-go. I am not one of those people. I'm like, slap it on. Because I was like, oh man, I'm gonna have to do his hands. And then I actually looked at stills and I was like, oh no, he's wearing gloves. <laughs> Normally I would do a shirt first, but I want to do one coat of this first. tend to do like armies. I don't do a whole lot of stuff where like everything's identical. Not really my jam. I tend to do more, um, there we go. I tend to do more stuff that's just like one-offs. So this is an interesting little exercise because now I'm painting figures that I've already painted before, but I'm painting them a second time. And I've done that once before. Um, I did my figures for the Fallout board game that Fantasy Flight put out. And then I did a copy for us to do as a giveaway during the Extra Life event that we run here in the fall. So a little plug on that uh, this fall in October. Actually, it's like the first weekend in November or something like that. Let me double check that. November 2nd. So if we do it on the actual day, like the official day, um, we're going to want to do, did I do white or off-white for him? I think I did white and then I did a wash. Um, yeah. So, if you're interested and you're in the area, and by in the area I mean somewhere in the like, greater Boston area in general, 
Um, during Extra Life Weekend, we do a big overnight event. We do 25 hours of gaming. The reason it's 25 hours is because usually it hits on daylight savings and we end up like 1 a.m. happens again. It's really <laughs> exhausting. It's a lot of fun though. Um, it, it, I don't know, this year it hit us hard. This year was a really tough one to get, get through. Um, I was doing okay for a while and then I just crashed hard afterwards. But we do have a really great time. We game all night. Um, we do take a, a little break, probably around like 3 a.m. And then around 4 a.m. we make waffles, because why wouldn't we? Um, but we also do a bunch of giveaways. We have people donate. When you donate, you get a ticket. You can put your tickets in for a bunch of giveaways, randomly draw someone, and then you get a prize. Very exciting. Um, we've had some really great prizes in the past. We've had um, like custom play mats from various magic artists. We've had um, a, like really, really good detailed lightsaber. We had um, like custom artwork. We've had various games and gaming paraphernalia like dice trays and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, we, we tend to have some really fun prizes. And last year I decided the prize that I was gonna do was the um, a painted set of Fallout figures. So I had to paint a set of Fallout figures. We'll go back and do his shirt one more time later. There we go. Sort of looking at how I did the did him last. Oh, he is so pale. So because he's wearing all black, I definitely I, I primed all of these in black because I knew um, the majority of their clothes are dark, except for Castigar, but I also didn't really want to go with just one of them primed white. So. But that means that I do have to go over his like face a bunch of times. Let's do his hair. That's what I used. Unfortunately, painting streams do involve a lot of shaking paints, which isn't fun to watch.
yellow bane of my existence color. I find yellow to be the very worst paint color to work with. It's my least favorite color to deal with. It just never goes on like it's streaky. Sorry, I'm going off camera. tend to end up like pulling the figures towards me. Let's get a little red for his tie. Is extra life over? It is. It's extra, extra life is over daylight savings again. Oh boy, okay, all right. What I also like about using the dropper bottles as opposed to the paint pots is that I, I'm going to get exactly what I want out of it.
Okay. I feel like there's some colors missing out of this box. So I only have three paints out and there's definitely holes. Oh, I know what's missing. No, nothing's actually missing, it's fine. I, I know what happened. There was one of those little grabber things to hold the base of a figure. No, it's not in here, so Derek must be using it. Okay. Let's get ourselves some dark grays. The mid gray for the sword. Sorry, that was my mic. I did not mean to brush past that. So the handle on his sword is going to be gold eventually. But we're going to start with the tan. So that I'm not trying to get opacity with a metallic paint. That's a bit of a waste. We're gonna end up filling like these two bits in with black because they're supposed to be part of sort of the bell of the handle and part of the guard. Just where his hand filled in. And he seems like the sort of guy who would take good care of his sword. We know from the movie that he did take good enough care of it.
I'm going to start doing some of the highlighting on his suit. We're also going to give him his gray overcoat. So I actually find this game a ton of fun. Um, I was very nervous about it when it was coming out because River Horse does absolutely beautiful games. Like the physicality of their games is gorgeous. You can't you can't deny that they look awesome. The figures for like the Dark Crystal game are unbelievable. Um, the gameplay isn't exciting. Um, it's it's fine, but it's definitely more something that you have because of what it is of like the property than something that you have that you love to play. Um, if you've played Talisman, there's a very Talisman esque. Thing to it where you basically go round and round and round the board. The board is sort of a omnidirectional, it's sort of like a, it's just a circle of spaces. And whenever you land on one that doesn't already have a card on it, um, you take a card off the top of the deck and you encounter it. And the idea is that you're trying to dig through that deck to reach a certain card. How hard is that? Yeah, not very. Um, you know, you can keep digging through a deck, you know, until you hit it. And the way the game is set up, um, both Labyrinth and Dark Crystal have um, this mechanic where you take the card that you're trying to get to, and you put it in the bottom third of the deck, I believe. I know it's the bottom section. I think it's a third of the deck. I think you divide it into thirds and then shuffle that in. Now what that means is it could be conceivably the very last card in the deck. It's possible. Um, what I think would mean, I don't know. I, I don't know a good way to do it, but by putting it in the bottom third of the deck, you, you're sort of forced to go around and around and around and around and around the board. Now, on one hand, this does um, let you sort of encounter things and, you know, get through challenges and so on. Um, you may get allies or objects and stuff. That's great. But you have a time limit. There's a certain number of rounds that you're going to be doing before you um, that's not what I want, that's what I want. Um, you only have a certain number of rounds before the game is over. So in Labyrinth, taking its cue from the 13 hours of the movie, you have 13 rounds. And that's it. And it's meant to be co-op. Um, you play up to four players and you play co-op. So the idea is you're supposed to try and team up. And there's a team up mechanic to it where, um, and this is where I, I mentioned that the you're using similar dice. So as you can see, Highlander comes with a bunch of polyhedrals. So you've got your D4s that are red. You've got your D6s that are green. You've got your D8s that are yellow. You've got your D10s that are purple, and D12s that are black. And then in um, Dark Crystal and Labyrinth, there's a D20 that's blue. 
every challenge you go up against has a certain die roll that you have to beat. There's a sort of a, you, you roll against. And if my strength is a d6, I roll the d6. But if the strength of my enemy is a d4, they're rolling a d4. Um, but it's possible even if you have the higher die that you'll roll under what um, your opponent is rolling. That means there's a lot of failed rolls. <laughs> there's a lot of failure. Um, you, you lose a lot of health. Um, that's frustrating. But I get it. It's, it's a randomized mechanic so that when you're fighting it's not just a, a given. The team up mechanic is supposed to mitigate that. It encourages you to team up because when you're teamed, you get to roll the dice of both characters or all three or all four and then use the highest roll. That's rolling with advantage. The problem is there's no way for you as characters to get a D up to a D20 the highest you're ever going to have is a 12. And then a lot of the enemies, um, or a couple of the enemies, including Jareth, is a, a d20. That's what he rolls. So, like, there's a whole like third of that die. <laughs> that you're almost half of that die, actually, that you're never, you, you can't beat. And you only get so many rolls. So that's a problem. And also, um, teaming up, you have to land exactly on another character's space in order to team up with them. So there's a lot of like ships in the night passing and then passing and trying to land together. And we found that the best way to do it was to actually get yourself sent to the oubliette and then wait there <laughs> and rest and let someone else get sent to the oubliette. But then you're wasting rounds and you only have 13 rounds to dig to that card. So you have to be making encounters every, every turn and then get into the Goblin City and then reach Jareth because there are several things you have to get through to reach Jareth and then once you reach Jareth, fight him. <sighs> That's a lot. So what we decided was instead of rolling with advantage, teaming up lets you add your rolls. Little house roll there. Um, and it, that's the, the big house roll that we decided on. And we also decided that teaming up, you could forfeit the rest of your movement roll if you wanted to stop at a friend. So you could, if you roll the five and they were four spaces away, you could forfeit that last move and land on their space. Um, and if their space didn't have a card in it, encounter, but now you're teamed, so you get to encounter together. And that works. Um, it makes Labyrinth a heck of a lot more fun to play because you just don't constantly feel like you're you're dying. Um, Dark Crystal is a little more complicated. It's a little more complex of a game, which is awesome. I, I do appreciate that. Um, Dark Crystal has a very similar mechanic where there's a board with a round sort of set of spaces and a center that you have to get into and fight with and a deck of encounter cards that you have to dig your way through and you bury your enter the palace card in the bottom third of the deck which means it could be at the very bottom um, but it has a couple of different it has a couple of changed mechanics first of all the um, round counter for dark crystal is uh, ogre's ossuary Ossuary? No, that's a bone thing. Ossuary? Something like that. It's uh, the thing that she uses to tell when the Great Conjunction is coming. And an ossuary is like what's under Paris. That's where all the bones are. Um, but it's it's like a thing that you use to sort of look at the, the heavens and stuff and make predictions. And it actually has um, a mechanic where you can give yourself up to like 18 rounds to make it a little bit easier, or you can decrease your number of rounds to make it harder. And I like that. I like that it's got some flexibility because, oof, that, uh, those 13 rounds are tough with the, what I think we might house rule if we ever play uh, labyrinth again 
is it's 13 rounds to get into the city and then maybe um, we count that as like once you're in the city you're not counting rounds it's 13 to get in there so this is the darkest of the gray I'm leaving black in the crevices. Um, but yeah, so Dark Crystal gives you extra rounds, which is really nice if you feel like you need them. And it also has an asymmetric play mechanic, which I think is very interesting. I don't think it quite works the way they wanted it to, um, but I really appreciate that they tried it. So it's, um, it's a, it's asymmetric in that you have up to four players and if you have four players, two of them are playing uh, Gelflings. So you're playing Kira and Jen. And if, and then you also have two players playing Skeksis. So you've got the Chamberlain and um, the guy the Chamberlain goes up, to get up against. They all have names and like roles within the, um, the hierarchy of the Skeksis apparently. There's a whole thing. I looked it up. So I painted those. And those were, God, those were fun to paint. They looked so good. There's so much texture in the clothes of the Skeksis on those. Oh my God, were they fun to paint. That is someone texting me. I should see who it is. see who that was but yeah so basically there's um oh hey orrery thanks i do have chat open i just was on a different window because i had been looking up stuff about extra life and i forgot to move back hey thunder speaks how's it going Um, but yeah, the game, it's got some issues, um, because the asymmetric play, what ends up happening is as the Gelflings, you want to team up, um, and it has the same team up mechanic as the other one, which we again house ruled to just, no, you just stop when you reach each other. Um, but it also has the mechanic, um, where you're, if you're playing the Gelflings, you can team up, but if you're playing the Skeksis, you're playing against each other. So if either of the Gelflings makes it into the palace and has a crystal shard and makes it to the final room, both Gelflings win, even if one of them has died along the way. However, for the Skeksis, their goal is to stop you from doing that, but also be on the throne at the time. And whichever Skeksi is on the throne at the time, um, if they stop the Gelflings, if you stop the Gelflings but you're not on the throne, you lose and your opponent wins. It's 
it's really interesting. And there's a deck that um, this when the Skeksis move, they get to do like a, an attack on the board. So they get to send like Crystal Bats or um, Gartham out. That's really neat. It's unbalanced. Um, when we played, I got hit. I was playing the Gelflings. And the idea is if you're playing like a two-player game, one of you is controlling the um, Skeksis and one of you is controlling both Gelflings, which is really neat. Um, unfortunately, that attack deck is vicious. And it basically knocked me out of contention. It, it basically took out the two Gelflings very early on. And there was just no coming back from it, um, which was really frustrating. Really frustrating. So, um, so I kind of stopped wanting to play that game. I really painted up his vest on mine so that it... I don't think I need to do that on this one as much. And it does make things look a little cleaner. So yeah, going into this game, um, enjoy your sushi, Thunder Speaks. Um, going into this game, knowing that it was coming from River Horse and knowing that River Horse had done um, these other two games that ended up being very, very similar, um, but with slightly more complex mechanics on the second one, but still kind of frustrating in places, I was very nervous about this one and what it was going to end up being like because I love Highlander so much and I really wanted it to be good. I wanted this game to be fun to play. I wanted it to um, really reflect the movies. Well, the movie singular. Because um, they never made any others. But I really wanted it to, to reflect that. And um, I was very nervous. I was so nervous that it was going to be another chase each other around the board sort of thing. Um, and that there would be a time limit because the gathering and so on. And it is not. Um, it is actually a really fun game and fairly well balanced. Which makes me very happy. Though I do think we were playing it wrong at one point. But I think the way we were playing it wrong made it less balanced than it actually is. So yeah,
Yeah, when we put a wash on this, that'll look better. Answer your earlier question, Thunder Speaks. Yes, this is in Monfacile. And the game's uh, booklet gives a backstory for him, which is really neat. I still don't like him, but his backstory is interesting.
yeah, it, going in um, with a plan makes this so much simpler. Like I just wanted to look at his sunglasses, but obviously I looked at them and now I'm back. I'm not going to worry about going really high on him because I am going to do a wash on him as well. So Thunder Speaks, when you are back, if you're still listening but busy with sushi, um, let me know when you're back because I want to show you the paint that I have. His shoes are staying plain black, not doing anything fancy.
I mean, also I started with the easiest character to paint. We're gonna let him sit for a little while before we do a wash on him, make sure he's dry. Hey, look, it's the Highlander. Connor McLeod of the Clan McLeod. So, the way this game differs from River Horse's other games that I have is actually quite, quite a lot. Um, still has gorgeous minis, still has the dice, but the dice are used um, to fight each other and to fight characters that you draw out of the deck. And the characters... I'll have stats. So if I'm playing the Kurgan, my cunning, if I'm doing a cunning challenge, I'm rolling a d4. Power challenge is a d8. And then influence challenge is a d4. Um, in comparison, let's say we've got Connor McLeod. He's not too cunning. It's not his thing. Um, and he's not as powerful as the Kurgan, but he does have a lot of influence. He makes friends. Um, and his, his word carries weight. And then you've got Castigear. Not a lot of influence. Average power, but ooh, is he cunning. Um, they also each have a special ability. But what I love about this is that the... Let's see. Your stats are not set in stone. So if you live a beggar's life by drawing from the era deck. You can see the beggar's life um, has a minus next to the I, a minus next to the P, but a plus next to the C. So if I am Castigear, 
and I live a beggar's life, I slide this card underneath, and I'm now rolling a d4 for power instead of a d6. I can't go lower than a d4 at all, so it doesn't really care, matter to my influence, but I'm rolling a d10 now for cunning rolls. That might be more useful to, say, Connor McLeod, except power is how you fight other immortals, like the other players in the game. Um, and different lives give you different stat changes. So that was a beggar's life. This is a life of luxury. A life of luxury doesn't give you any more cunning. It does make you less powerful, but it does add to your influence. You can have two of these cards in play under your character at any given time. And that means you can sort of change up your life. There's also a way to screw other characters, not literally, um, but to mess with them because there's a deck that you draw from when you are fighting and that has the beheading card in it. So this is a challenge deck. It has that uh, skull on it. And the number of cards in the challenge deck depends on the number of immortals when you start, which is really neat. And it has things like uh, collateral. Choose an immortal in the arena, that immortal loses an ally. Um, Scar, the immortal or immortals that rolled lowest in the duel lose two quickening tokens. So you gain quickening tokens by fighting um, sort of NPCs in one of the decks. Um, opportunity, you gain a weapon. And in here somewhere, behead. So you want to be the one to, over, to turn over a card in this deck, and you turn over, be the one to turn over the card in the deck by winning a fight in the arena. And there is in here, Ruin. And as you can see, it has no modifiers. But since you can only have two of these cards, you're replacing someone's life, um, life card that they have intentionally put on their character to modify their stats with a, a null value. So you've negated one of the lives that they've led. It's a really neat mechanic. Um, so you have multiple choices during the um, during the game. You can opt to go hunting for another um, for a fight and fight NPCs. Let's see. I think I did a base of a forest green on that. You can opt to go hunting. You can opt to sort of lay low, live your life. Um, so hunting has a hunting deck has a challenge deck or it's like a hunting it, the hunting deck and it's got things that you would come across when you were out looking for a fight um, the era deck is when you're laying low and just living your lives and that's how you gain allies that's how you um, gain different lifetimes and stuff and how certain events can happen and as you go through the era deck you're going to eventually come out of ancient times into modern day there's a certain point at which um, the gathering is going to happen and everyone moves to the arena the board flips and you sort of lose all the decks except the challenge deck and that's it <laughs> that's all, all you get it's it's time to fight until only one remains which is really cool um you get to use the quickening tokens that you've gained by fighting other characters um or fighting you know other uh immortals in the era deck or in the this heart of hunting deck, um, you get to use those to re-roll. So the more you've been fighting, the sort of more chances to re-roll or spin up a die. So if my cunning is a six, so I'm rolling a d6, I can spend a quickening token to roll a d8 instead. Um, it doesn't say in the booklet whether there's a limit on that. What we sort of figured was um, we would put a one re-roll, one roll up per challenge uh, house rule cap on that um, until the gathering. And once the gathering happens, you can just spend them at will. Um, but put a cap on it to start with.
What I also like about these paints is that they do tend to be self-leveling. Um, so if I blop it on somewhere, it hasn't like completely screwed me. I just love the detail on these figures. They're really nice. They take paint very nicely. Notice I didn't do uh, Lumira's first. That um, peacock cloak is awesome. Man, is it a pain to paint. It, there's so many layers to that thing. Interesting. His sword is definitely on the one that I have. His sword is sort of parted away from his um, figure. So this mold was a little bit different. Like he just he popped out a little bit differently, I guess. So you can see his cloak is a little not quite the same. It's like mine pulled away a little more. Which is actually, you know what, I'm happy about. This is going to be easier to paint. I don't have to worry about getting behind the blade as much.
that was the green I used. Oh, I need to do his knees. I forgot I need to do his knees.
So I want these the same base color, and that's intentional, because um, there's going to be a lot of variety later. But I do want them the same brown to start out. Too slow. The music is too slow. Yeah, 
you know. Better. We're going to let those base coats dry for a bit. It's time for a wash. Now the question is, where are my washes? I have some of my own. Oh, that's yellow. That's not going to help me here. Nope, not in there.
No. Maybe I don't have them with me. Well, that would be annoying. Where are they then? Um, I may have to crack into that other box. Yeah, I think I will. Oh, well, that's interesting. Because I have. Yeah. Well, so it goes. I have my own bottle of Nuln oil. I don't know where it is.
I'm gonna have to look at home for my my washes. I don't know what happened to them. I had them in my bag, and I was nervous about them in my bag, so I didn't want them to open. So he's not done, done, but he's getting there. He's close. I need to work on his hair a little bit. But otherwise, he's, he's in good shape. You can see the two together. This one's the one that's done. So now that I've got the base coats in, I have to go in and do like highlighting and detail work. <sighs> that tartan. Yeah. I'm probably only going to be working for another 20 minutes or so, and then I'm going to call it a day. Um, but I feel like I made some really good progress today, which is really nice. I'm actually going to let his base coats dry. Who is next in the box? Oh, it's Ramirez. It's time. So here we have our side by side. So we're going to need a red and a blue. And then like blues and greens and shiny stuff and yeah. Good times. We're going to start dark and work up. I'm not into this.
I'm going to have to go over that scabbard later, but it's just too much of a pain to avoid it now when I'm trying to get as much coverage as possible with the blue. So his cloak actually has like a blue satin lining because he's Ramirez and he's like that. Um, we had a whole conversation, my husband and I, at one point about like, I think it was my husband and I had the conversation about like, how did he end up with like his peacock feather cloak? Because he's called a Spanish peacock in the, like that's one of his descriptions. Even though he's not Spanish worked as the chief metallurgist to the king of Spain. But like, at what point did this like dude from ancient Egypt decide, I want a cloak made of peacock feathers? And was that actually a brief to the costume department or did someone in the costume department take it upon themselves to do this because they saw the descriptor of him as a peacock. Like, well, he's a peacock. Gotta put peacock feathers on him then, huh? Like, who, who, who made that decision? But his cloak has a, um, like, bright blue uh, lining. It's got a blue, sort of shimmery lining. And then it's all peacock feathers on the back. So we're going to start it with a base of uh, this teal. So I actually did, when I, I did the like research for him, um, I did an enormous amount of like looking at actual peacock feathers. They're actually really interesting. Because you think of them and you're like, oh, they're green blue. There's also some brown. <laughs> there Actually, there's a lot of layer going on with them. It's not just like that they're metallic or iridescent. It's There's like a whole bunch of different colors that are happening. And just being like, oh, they're iridescent doesn't really cover it because there are base colors under that iridescence. we're starting with teal we're actually going to end up going more into a green but with a blue iridescence to it and then these feathers up at the top here they're sculpted so that you can see the eyes of the feathers and if you actually look at peacocks um, everyone knows the sort of iconic peacock feather with the it's like on their tails but if you look at his cloak and stills from the movie the cloak itself, the like main body of the cloak, isn't actually made all of those. The collar is, and the edges are, but the actual body of the cloak is made more of like their, the feathers that are on their necks and bodies, which have more of a um, black and green iridescence to them. Which is why we're starting with sort of a teal. I promise it will look better once, it'll look more like this once we, we get into it. I don't remember exactly how I did it last time, but I have thoughts on how I want to do it this time. So as soon as I'm done with his base coats, I think I'm going to call it a day. I don't know if Andy is currently watching, but I'll text him. But I basically just want to get some base coating done on him and then, um, yeah, call it a day. Save my eyes. 
I'm in rather desperate need of new glasses, so. pretty well. I think I'm going to call it a day. Okay. Not mess with my eyes too much. Yeah. His base coating is mostly done. Um, it's just his hat and his boots and I'm going to leave him. I'll do that later. All right. But that means I got, so I got base coats done on him and Connor. So that's, Connor. so I got Connor done um, for base coating. Iman Fasil is mostly done. I just got to finish up with his hair. Mm -hmm. And then I got most of the base coat, probably about 90% of the base coating done on um, Ramirez here. And then, um, yeah, I, I feel like I made some good progress today. Yeah. So thank you for watching. Thank you for joining us. If you're watching this on YouTube, thank you for watching there. If you're watching the VOD on Twitch, thank you for watching there. And hopefully I will see you later in the week. Bye, everybody. Bye.